Hi there, and welcome to video number one of Unit 6, The Gilded Age, from 1865 to 1898. So, we're going to start right away with 6.2, which is Westward Expansion. 6.2 deals with Westward Expansion and Economic Development. Um, in our next video, we'll talk a little bit about social, cultural, and development. But first, we're going to talk about economic development. So, we're going to start with some of the reasons for westward expansion circa 1865 to 1898, which is, of course, the Gilded Age. Now, <clears throat> we've already talked in class and other videos about um, a little bit about westward expansion, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the second half of the 19th century here. So reasons for westward expansion. We're going to talk about a bunch of different frontiers here, starting with the mining frontier. So as we already discussed a little bit in class, the California gold rush in 1849 really started the pattern for other gold rushes and strikes. Thousands of prospectors poured into California, Nevada, Oregon, Alaska, and many other Western regions like Colorado, um, looking to, to prospect a strike at which for um, mostly gold and silver, especially. So um, individual prospectors came first, but not too far after mining companies are going to follow. And those mining companies are going to be able to afford to use deep shaft mining technology that was pretty expensive. And a lot of times they created monopolies, buying up plots of, of, of claims of these, um, these mining areas and creating monopolies. So the 1859 discovery of the Comstock load was a really great example of a major, major um, mining discovery. This was in Nevada and it was silver. Now this actually paved the way for rapid statehood in Nevada uh, because of the boom in population. Boom towns would appear like Virginia City. Uh, now these were called boom towns because they appeared virtually overnight. Um, and sprang up really quickly as, as thousands would would rush in to try to make their profit off of this this you know strike, and um, and a lot of them lasted for a few years. But it's actually pretty common for these boom towns to then become ghost towns. Now the boom towns, for as long as they lasted, lasted often did help to pave the way to statehood. It gave the necessary population. So for example, in Nevada, it became a state not long after the discovery of the Comstock load. Um, but these kind of cities often became ghost towns when the mines dried up. So you can actually see an image here of Virginia City, which is really just built into these hills where the mines are. And in 1875, there were 25,000 people living in Virginia City, which is a really pretty large number. Uh, today, only 787 people live there. So a lot of these little towns dried up into ghost towns once the, the mines went bust, when there was no longer anything left to mine. The boom towns went up virtually overnight and they became really famous for their saloons, their dance halls, their vigilante justice. But they also drew in other migrants who provided services for the mining population. So boom towns didn't just consist of miners. They consisted of people who were drawn to these new centers in order to provide services to the prospecting miners miners and make their fortune that way. Okay, other reasons for westward expansion, the cattle frontier. So these really vast open grasslands that ran from Texas to Canada um, had an economic potential that really was mostly realized after the Civil War. So a lot of this area was really not settled before the Civil War. And um, the it was possible to farm in these areas, although it was a challenge, but it was definitely a great area for cattle farming. So previously, before the Civil War, cattle were raised in Texas pretty much on a small scale, mostly by Mexican cowboys called vaqueros. And um, after the Civil War in the late 1860s, we start to see uh, um, there's an enormous amount of cattle that are really roaming Texas freely. There's about 5 million head of cattle roaming around Texas. And it made it a really easy business to get into because the cattle and grass were free. So a lot of people got into this pretty easily. There were very few barriers to entry in this business, at least initially. So. The construction of railroads are going to open up eastern markets to Texas cattle. So cattle were driven along the cattle trails like the Goodnight Lovin Trail and the Chisholm Trail, the Western Trail, all of these kind of trails up to areas like Kansas City, for example, where you would see stockyards. The first stockyards were in Kansas City. And this is where these rail lines were connected. The early rail lines were connected through Kansas. So these um, really big uh, cattle drives emerged 
uh, in the 1860s and 70s. And at this time, most of the cowboys were African-American or Mexican, and they were paid very little for the very dangerous work they did. Now, these cattle drives, which uh, really flourished in the 60s and 70s, are going to decline in the 1880s for a few different reasons. First of all, overgrazing destroys the grass. Okay, grass is... Um, is not the most efficient form of food and you know cattle needed to eat a lot of it which is fine if it's just wild cattle but when you're actually trying to raise cattle for beef consumption then you you're raising as much as possible so they actually did overgraze this area and destroy a lot of the grass and then there was a winter blizzard that was followed by a drought in 1885 and 1886 um, and that actually killed off 90 percent of the cattle on top of this homesteaders were beginning to use barbed wire these grasslands had very little fencing uh wooden fencing because there wasn't a lot of wood available but they started to use barbed wire to cut off what was previously just open rangeland. So this barbed wire actually prevented the cattle from roaming freely and eating grass wherever they wanted. Uh, on top of this, wealthy cattle owners are going to start to realize the future of this was developing these huge ranches. So we see the development of massive ranches beginning in the 1880s that use these scientific ranching techniques. They fed cattle hay and grains and, and you know higher calorie um, feed, kept them in one place and fattened them up before taking them to the stockyard. So these massive cattle drives really declined in the 1880s. Okay, um, other reasons for westward expansion, obviously kind of an obvious one is the farming frontier. So in 1862, the Homestead Act uh, was passed, and this was an attempt to, to really settle these lands to the west with American settlers. They offered 160 acres of public land to any family that would settle on that land build a home and farm it for at least five years. So this free land is going to combine with railroad uh, promotions uh, and uh, land speculators. Um, they induced a lot of people to come and attempt to farm on the Great Plains between 1870 and 1900. So a lot of them ended up um, coming. Some of them took advantage of the Homestead Act. Uh, ironically enough, the prospectors that often convince people to come out were doing this specifically because they were hoping that people would not be able to manage it. It would be driven out by something else, drought, um, lack of money, lack of resources, and then the land inspectors would be able to buy up that land really cheap. I mean, again, this is federal land, what became federal land, um, that was being carved out and handed out to homesteaders. Um, and a lot of this land ended up, these public lands ended up not in the hands of homesteaders, but in the hands of the railroad companies and the land speculators. So ironically enough, a lot more people actually ended up purchasing land rather than just getting free land. Now, uh, a lot of these early people that lived on the grasslands were called sod busters. They built their homes out of sod bricks. This is something we've talked about in class. Wood was almost non-existent. Um, so they had to really use the materials that they had to build their homes. Uh, since there was no wood for for fencing either, barbed wire, as I just mentioned, helped farmers fence in their land. Uh, and then mail order windmills actually allowed for the deep well drilling that were needed to provide water. So 160 acres was rarely enough to earn a living on these really drought prone plains. Two thirds of homesteaders failed failed by 1900. And those who survived really did so because they made use of dry farming techniques. They used these very hardy Russian wheat strains that could stand up under less resources. Um, they had to really reshape the environment by creating dams and irrigation systems. Um, and a lot of these were built by the government uh, eventually, after 1900 mostly. And this is gonna fundamentally reshape the rivers and the physical environment of the plains. Okay, a few other factors that help to explain westward expansion, the construction of railroads. So five transcontinental railroads were constructed between 1869 and 1890, usually with huge land grants and subsidies from the government. A lot of the best public lands were actually given over to the railroad companies, often more land than they needed. Um, the Morrill Land Grant Act actually encouraged some expansion because the Land Grant Act allowed for the creation of land grant colleges. Okay, colleges where the land was granted, and especially in exchange for um, continuing research on agricultural and different scientific farming techniques. Um, this land, of course, was usually, as all this land we're talking about, and we're going to talk about this in the next video, but all this land we're talking about, you have to keep in mind this quote unquote public land. This was all land that was seized from indigenous groups from Native Americans. Um, and 
who were then pushed off the land into the worst pieces. And then um, that that land was, again, given away sometimes to homesteaders, but more often to railroad companies and public spectators and uh, or land spectators, um, speculators. And the Morrill Land Grant Act also took some of this land um, and it created opportunities for higher education and cultural improvements. So um, this was also something that kind of encouraged a little bit of westward expansion, too, as you created these kind of small college towns. This actually here is a picture of Morrill Hall um, at the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, fun fact, that's actually my own alma mater. This is the original university. Now, obviously, it's only one of only a few buildings of UNR, which is a huge university now. But it's called Moral Hall because it was created with the Moral Land Grant Act, uh, the university was. So uh, it definitely helped to create some of these college towns, created agricultural research and opportunities for higher education. So some families were able to actually send their children to, Western families were to send their children to colleges on the West Coast as opposed to send them all the way to the East Coast. Um, and of course, Manifest Destiny was still a thing, right? This idea that it's our destiny as a nation to go across from you know sea to sea, that is still a thing that is that is kind of driving the sort of dream of the West that's sending a lot of people out West. Okay, so what challenges did farmers in particular face in the West and how did they respond to these challenges? So a lot of challenges for Western farmers. As I said, two thirds of them um, failed by 1900. So one of the big challenges is actually the mechanization of agriculture. Okay, the mechanization of farming, um, thanks to the second industrial revolution, created a lot of technology like the, the mechanized reaper and the combine harvester. This really replaced a lot of human and animal labor for planting and harvesting. This actually did a few different things. Um, first of all, it made the production of corn and wheat double between 1870 and 1900. Um, but the, the problem with that is a huge increase in supply means that the price is going to drop. And when those prices drop, it really became harder for small farms to compete with larger industrial farms. They simply couldn't afford the machines that these larger farms did. So they were, they were essentially, it was costing them more to create the same product, but they were still having to sell it at this low price. Um, thanks to these, this mechanized farming. Okay, they quickly became clear that 160 acres without Homestead Act, a lot of it because that land was so dry, was really just not enough to sustain a farm. Um, these declining food prices are going to combine with very high input prices to drive a lot of small farmers out of business. So the food prices declined precipitously um, thanks to that mechanization and also competition from grain coming from Argentina, Russia, and Canada. But farmers still had these mortgages and these really high interest rates to pay and producing more crops, which seemed like a solution, only helped to lower prices even further. The industrial corporations formed these really monopolistic trusts to keep the prices of manufactured goods, of farm tools and equipment, uh, the things farmers needed, really, really high. So these manufactured goods were expensive, but the prices were dropping for the things they were selling. On top of this, railroad owners charged unnaturally high prices to ship food to the market, and, and they even refused to service some of the very rural areas. So even if you were in an area that got service, the railroad owners kind of banded together and agreed to really charge these very high prices um, to, to transport food to market. So it was very, very high input prices, uh, prices for transportation and, and uh, tools, but very low prices were coming from the land. The taxes felt um, very unfair as well because land and property was taxed really heavily, but income from example, stocks and bonds that the wealthier people might have was not taxed um, as income. Wealthy investors made money without having to pay these really high taxes. Uh, on top of that, the protective tariffs that were intended to protect domestic manufacturing only seemed to really help wealthy industrialists. To, so to farmers, Western farmers in particular, but also Southern farmers, it really did feel that the tax system in the United States was designed to punish farmers, small farmers and property owners and really just benefit wealthy industrialists and wealthy investors. Okay, so in response to this, we see the organization of farmers. The National Grange Movement, um, essentially was created to defend members from um, from the the actions, bad actions of the middlemen, the manufacturers, the trusts, the railroads, 
Um, the Grange movement pushed for laws to regulate railroad prices and to stop these abusive practices. And these laws were called Granger laws. A uh, big example of this, the Munn versus, Munn versus Illinois in 1877, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the right of the state to regulate businesses like railroads to prevent unfairly high prices. So we are going to start to see a series of laws um, that will pass, that will try to, that will benefit farmers economically. Farmers alliances are also going to form across the West and the South, where farming was the you know primary industry. They educated farmers about scientific farming methods, um, and they helped them to take both economic and political action. Um, in the South, both poor white and black farmers often join these alliances. Um, and then finally, in the Commerce Act of 1886, railroad rates, it was, it was actually formally put into law that railroad rates had to be reasonable and just. Um, and this act also established the Interstate Commerce Commission that managed these railroad and rail lines. OK. All right. So that's it today for uh, for unit six lecture video number one. You're going to join us next time for lecture video number two. And we're going to talk about some of the cultural and social consequences of westward expansion. So we'll see you then.